What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Mass Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-host, Leah Matthews. How you doing, Leah? Hey, Chief. I'm doing good. How are you? Doing well. I'm awesome. Awesome. And, and you know, Julie, Julie couldn't make it with us again today. So, uh, yeah, yeah, but it's all good. We, we're going to hold it down. Starting to wonder Julie. if she's coming back. I know. I know. Maybe she <laughs> an, another podcast to jump on or something. I don't know. <laughs> a better gig. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So our next guest have a remarkable story that really takes you into the kind of the grim realities of what wounded warriors deal with on the road to recovery and how unwavering love from family and community are vital ingredients to this young man's beautiful testimony. Uh, Leah, please introduce today's guest. Chief, yes, sir. We are very honored to have our guest with us today. He's a retired army sergeant and a wounded warrior, and he's joined by his biggest supporter, his wife. They are here today to boost morale for the military community and discuss their new book, Beautifully Broken. Please join us in welcoming Josh and Paige Wetzel. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for having us. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you for joining us today. Appreciate you, brother. Yeah. Awesome. We're excited to have you guys on, and we want to get started. But first, just a little bit of housekeeping stuff. Uh, everybody watching, thanks so much for tuning in. Let us know where you're watching from. And if you have any questions for Josh and Paige, we'll be reading those live throughout the broadcast. Now is a good time to start your watch party so you can enjoy this great interview with your friends. And if you're not following us, you should, because we have lots of guests lined up for Chief Chat. Great guests, so you don't want to miss out. Awesome, awesome. So Josh and Paige, man, we're super excited to have you with us today. How you guys doing? We're doing great. Super excited to be on the show today. Yeah, no, so it's not, it's not a lot when we have, like, it's not many times that we have real-life heroes on our show. And so uh, we want to make sure that we pay homage to you and let you know that we appreciate what you what you've done for our great nation, and uh, thank you for spending some time with us today. Yeah, thanks for having us. I uh, I would say though I am not one of those heroes. I just I just had a rough day at work one day, and we've all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, listen, we're all heroes, and and anybody who volunteers to kind of uh, sacrifice uh, whatever it is that they have going on uh, at home or whatever the case may be. Uh, is considered a hero in my book. So Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, so uh, can you tell us where you're joining us from today and uh, how you guys been faring during the pandemic? Yeah, um, so we're joining you guys from Auburn, Alabama. Um, uh -huh. we, uh, we've we lived here since 2014 when I medically retired out of the military. And, uh, um, you know, we're doing pretty good during this pandemic. I work at Auburn University now and, um, you know, we're slowly getting back integrated back at work now. And, um you know, this time is honestly, it's been really good for um, me and my family um, to kind of focus on, um, you know, getting this book released and everything, and then also kind of focus on like where God's taking us next. And as far as how we're faring during the pandemic, um, we actually live in a home for our troops house. So I have to shout them out because our home is specially made just for Josh's um, handicapped needs and I don't, we've never been at home like this before. So to be able to be in a home that is made, especially for Josh, I mean, we've just never appreciated, appreciated it like we have had to this year. And so we're just so thankful to not only live in a great city, but also live in a home that was built just for uh, wounded handicapped veterans. And so Homes for Our Troops built this house for us in 2016. And it really came in clutch in 2020. So we're really excited to be here. Yeah, that's well, excellent. Yeah, sorry, Chief. Go ahead. No, it, and it's awesome that uh, an, an Auburn Tiger and an LSU Tiger over here can coexist <laughs> in the same in the same chat. So, man, we appreciate that. <laughs> well, at least it's not Alabama. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I could agree with you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, excellent. Glad that you guys are doing well um, and hanging in. You know, during this this odd year. And so, Josh, know your family has deep military ties. Your your father served in the army, and five uncles and two grandfathers served as well. Yet that was a path that you initially did not want to take. So, can you share why that was, and then what changed your mind about it? Um, yeah. So, you know, as a little boy, obviously, you know, watching my dad and everything, you know, as a kid, that's something that I wanted to do. As I got older. 
Um, you know, I didn't um, really want that discipline in my life, you know, coming out of high school, I <laughs> was kind of a wild child. And, um, you know, I went straight out of high school to play uh, baseball at a little junior college in North Georgia um, and uh, flunked right out of school my first year there and had to move <laughs> back home and, um, you know, just school and and really anything in general um, wasn't really for me. You know, I wasn't really headed um, anywhere. Um, and, um, you know, it wasn't until probably four years later, um, you know, I met Paige um, in 2006. So I graduated high school in 2005, um, met Paige in 2006 at my second school. And, um, you know, we were dating and things were going well. And um, then I was heading nowhere and she was heading somewhere, you know, she had goals in her life. She was, you know, finishing up her bachelor's degree and starting to work on her master's degree. And I was, you know, trying to finish my freshman year of college for the fourth time. And, um, you know, we broke up for a little while because, you know, I wasn't really heading anywhere and didn't really have a future. And, um, you know, after I flunked out of school that last time and got put on academic probation, they essentially just asked me not to come back. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I decided like, hey, maybe it is time for that, um, for the military and the, and the discipline and all of that. Awesome, man. Well, listen, pa Paige, you, 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 it, it, takes a, it takes a strong woman to, to lift somebody up that doesn't want to do anything. So I uh, appreciate your, your sacrifice. <laughs> You're a special one for sure. Absolutely. Listen, I, I get it. Trust me. Yeah. Glad and, to hear. Sorry, go ahead, Paige. Well, I was just saying like it was a very, um, I supported Josh as a friend at that point because we weren't boyfriend and girlfriend when he kind of announced I'm going to go into the military. I was kind of like, good for you you know and, yeah. and that one don't have anything to do with me which you know here we are 10 years later but um you know i was just kind of like i think this is going to be good for you because um you know i can see you trying to get a grip on your life and there are just skills that you need that you realize you need but you don't know how you're going to obtain them but in the back of my mind i'm thinking you know um like you can't make it to a nine o'clock class. Like, you know, that the army does stuff like early in the morning, you know? like how, how, how are we going to do that? You know, but I'm telling you, I've never, and I know that this is, this is something that a lot of people would say about military people. Um, Josh just thrived in that environment. You know, it was kind of like Josh needs full immersion, you know? And um, I think with college, there was just too much freedom and too much of just, you can control a lot of your day, you know? And so I just thought you're, you're not going to be able to handle this. This is going to be too much for you. But, um, what I observed was just that this is exactly what he needs and the things that people would kind of complain about. Josh never complained. It never bothered him like getting up early and having to do PT for hours or, uh, having to do PT because somebody didn't like make their bed up the correct way you know like stuff like that just didn't bother him he was like all right this you know I need to get in better shape so I'll just do this and those are the things that you hear complaining about and I just never heard that so it was so interesting for me to like kind of ride this like four-year dating experience with him where he didn't seem to really know what I mean he would wake up in the day and not know what the <laughs> the day entailed at all to going to an environment where every minute was mapped out and you knew exactly what your expectations were. And he was just able to meet those expectations and with a smile on his face, you know, so I just didn't expect that. And it was just really cool to see that. Yeah. I, I can totally like relate to that because um, I think the military kind of brings on this team atmosphere. I know he plays, plays sports, right. And it brings on this team and, and people depend on you. Other people depend on you and you just don't want to let other people down. So knowing, because I'm not a morning person either, like, <laughs> like if, if you gave me the too much freedom to do stuff, especially coming out of high school, man, I, I yeah, I don't even want to talk about that, but, uh, <laughs> but, but here I am today. But like I said, uh, just having that team atmosphere to, to, and structure, uh, you just like, you know what, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for a bunch of people. So I need to right. I, I get where I need to be. Right. And that's good news. Uh, as a mom, mom of boys 
teenage yeah. boys, <laughs> it's like, yes, okay, there is some hope here. Right. That, you know, one day they're going to grow up one day that that brain is going to click and they're going to be like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get my life somewhere. So yeah. there's a consequence to this. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Leah, Leah, and I got, I got all boys and I, I can hope and pray they find a page in their life somewhere. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Somebody they'll listen to besides yes, yes. mom. Because they do not <laughs> listen to me at all. And so, but they're, they're yeah. good boys. They're just, they're just boys. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Need, need some direction here. <laughs> so <laughs> that makes me feel good. Like, okay, we're, we're not all lost here. <laughs> so Josh, continuing on talking about your career, um, early in your military career, you deployed to Afghanistan and that changed your life dramatically. So do you mind telling us about that day in 2012? Yeah. Um, so I deployed to, um, right outside of Kandahar, Afghanistan in 2012, um, with second infantry division. And, um, we were in a little village called Mushan, um, just kind of out in the middle of nowhere along route hyena. And, um, toward, you know, our main threat while we were there was improvised explosive devices. So um, everywhere, every patrol we were on, um, we had to walk behind a metal detector like ducks in a row. And um, that was, you know, a new thing for us. We didn't train like that. You don't ever train like that in the army. And, um, you know, it was a new thing for us and it was something that we had to adapt to quickly. Um, when we first got there, um, we had entrusted our metal detectors to our lower enlisted guys and, um, you know, people, you know, we got a couple of our strikers blown up and um, a couple guys got injured. And so, you know, as a team leader, um, you know, we, all the team leaders kind of came together and tried to figure out like, how, how are we going to combat this, you know, and um, we decided to take the, take over the metal detectors because usually team leaders have, you know, one, a little more to lose because, you know, a lot of, a lot of the team leaders are married or, you know, they've been in the military a little longer, a little older usually. And um, so they're naturally going to be a little more careful and then they've got more experience. Um, and so I took over that role, loved it. Um, you know, I wasn't born with a healthy fear of anything. So, um, you know, trying to find bombs in the ground was, you know, exciting for me um, as a kid. If you if you've ever seen the movie Old Yeller, like I was like Alice in Old Yeller, like I was always picking up critters and um, you know, rattlesnakes and everything. Like I just didn't really oh, hear anything. I climbed on everything. Like it just, I was your typical like rough boy, you know? And, uh, so that translated well to the military because I got to shoot weapons and jump out of airplanes and do all kinds of cool stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, leading the, leading the pack with the metal detector was right up my alley, you know, and I uh, got pretty good at it. And, um, and then, you know, later in uh, May, you know, we, we got a, uh, you know, orders for, you know, like a three, four day clearing mission. We we're going to clear from the east side of our area of operations all the way to the west side. And um, we were kind of combining forces with the rest of our battalion on this on this effort. And so um, we were on day two of this mission and, um, you know, we were moving pretty well and, you know, we could see our uh, end objective and, um we, it was about 117 degrees outside, you know, beautiful day, if you could imagine. And uh, we, uh, we were moving along and we came up to this dirt road and I noticed that there were two lines of rocks on this road. And um, you know, immediately my spidey senses went off because, you know, obviously you don't see that in nature usually. And so um, I knew that, you know, from my experience that that was probably marking an IED somewhere. Um, and so um, you know, I radio back to my platoon sergeant, like, Hey, I'm going to take a little longer going across this road, um, mark it really well. So everybody knows where to go. And, um, so took my time. He was good with that. Took my time, marked it really well. We got everybody across the road and, um, we were going across a field to a wall with a low space in the wall. And as we, you know, approached it, I cleared in front of it the best I could. And as I went to reach across to clear the other side is when I stepped on the IED, um, instantly losing both of my legs. And, um, you know, I can remember the entire thing from flipping through the air to landing on the ground. And, um, you know, as soon as it happened, I, I had a pretty good idea of what had happened because I'd watched a guy the day before um, do it. And he was a pretty high double amputee as well. Um, and so, but my main thought was, 
you know, like how do I calm my medic down? Uh, because he was a normally like a shaky guy in real life. And so, and he was my best friend. And so if you, you know, watch your best friend step on I, I, IED and lose both of their legs, you're probably going to be a little extra shaky. And I didn't want that guy working on me. So I had to figure out like, how am I going to calm him down? And mm -hmm. so, you know, as soon as he got to me, I was like, Hey bro, uh, one, you know, we're going to get through this. It's going to be all right. Two, did you see that sick flip that I just did? <laughs> and uh, that kind of changed the mood from that point yeah. forward. You know, I literally just joked around the entire time um, I was on the ground there and um, I never feared dying, you know? Um, and, you know, when he was, you know, trying to get me to calm down, I was like, did you see that sick flip? And he was like, he was like, man, just shut up. I was like, seriously, I would have landed that if I had feet, you know? And he was like, well, how do you know you don't have feet? And I was like, well, you just answered the question for me. Thank you. Yes. But we're going to make it through this, you know? And mm -hmm. so that kind of set the tone for the rest of my recovery. And, and mm -hmm. it's worth mentioning, I think, that um, the reason Josh stepped on that was because it was the first all carbon content um, IED that they had found in the area. So he just had a straight metal detector and there was no metallic content in it um, because the, and that was something that I didn't know for a long time. So when Josh gets back to the U S and we're kind of talking, he was, you know, fine talking about things. And he was like, yeah, I actually volunteered for the metal detector. And so I'm sitting back kind of like, okay, that was a piece of information I didn't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. he was like, yeah. So I had the metal detector, when I stepped on the ID, I'm sitting there like, wait a second, wait a second. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you just have all these questions like, was it on? Like, you know, yeah, and, yeah. but then we got like a report that was like, no, there was no metal content. So like, it didn't make you feel better, but it kind of made you feel better, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. so, well, for me, it's, it's just amazing that, um, the, you know, the first kind of the first thing you thought about was your, your fellow soldier, uh, right? Others. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to be like, you know what? I know he's going to freak out. So let me let me make it calm for him so he can kind of do his job and, and feel good about doing his job. Because, man, that's that's awesome, man. That's awesome to hear. It's, it's a great story. So. Uh, so, Paige, what was it like when you received the phone call um, about what happened to Josh? Yeah, I think, um, you know, every time Josh's platoon went outside the wire, something happened. You know, we were. Uh, I was getting those family readiness groups e emails. I mean, more than once a week, sometimes of, you know, somebody getting blown up, somebody getting killed. And um, so I knew things were, were not great. And um, after a while, after, you know, three months over there, it's just the odds just start really kind of stacking up against you, you know? And so it was about six 30 in the morning and it was just a, phone number that I didn't have a weird time of day. And I just knew that was what it was, you know, and, um, I let it ring. And then there was a voicemail and I just got the most sick, like chills feeling like you're going to vomit type feeling, you know? And, um, I called the number back and it was a, uh, someone from, and I didn't realize this at the time, but it was someone from, like in the United States that was nowhere near Josh that had just been relayed this information, you know? Okay. Um, but they were telling me that Josh had a, um, he had lost both of his legs. He had two broken arms and he was unconscious from the blast and he had a um, C4 break in his neck. And so um, I always tell people that I was gifted with misinformation because um, while, I mean, when someone is blown up, there's, there's a lot to take in and it's really hard to be accurate about what, I mean, there's the obvious, there's no legs, but you know, there were a lot of other things going on. Um, and um, I think there was so much adrenaline going through like his body at the time that if he had broken his back or anything like that, they wouldn't have been able to tell by the way he was acting, yeah. especially if he's laying on the ground telling jokes. Yeah. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at first I just thought like, man, you know, yeah, the missing legs is, is terrible, but what if he's paralyzed? And if he's not been awake, you know, what is that? What's my role in that? When he wakes up, like, what am I, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to do? What is his understanding of how injured he is, you know? 
And so for about two and a half days, I, I carried that information and not really knowing uh, like, what if he wakes up and doesn't realize he's been injured and things like that. And just my imagination went wild. And um, it took about five days to get him back to the United States. And so for about two and a half of those days, I really thought, you know, he, he has no cognizance of what's going on. And um, finally, I spoke to someone that kind of helped work on him. And he said, um, hey, you know, I'm so sorry about Josh. I just want you to know that, you know, he was in good spirits and all this other stuff. And he had some things he wanted me to send you. Do you know, I know you're traveling and trying to figure out where you're going to meet up with him, but do you know where I could send you these things? And it was stuff like a journal and some things he had in his pocket and things like that. And I was so confused because I was like, wait, what do you mean? I thought he's been unconscious this whole time. And that's when I learned like the sick flip story. And I, okay. he was like, oh God, no, he was laying on the ground. He was running his mouth. He was telling jokes and like all this <laughs> other stuff. And at that moment, I just, I just broke down and cried because I was just kind of like, I'm still getting Josh back. And it just really put things in perspective of how like this seems so awful but it could have been so much worse. And there are so many wives and moms and brothers and sisters of these, of these veterans that like, they get the officer at their door, you know, they get the, they get the, um, you know, person saying that like your, your husband didn't even make it to Kandahar, you know, and it just really put things in perspective for me. And from that point forward, and I'm not saying that I handled things well or anything, but like, I just had this like this gratitude of just man this could have been so much worse and to know that <laughs> I don't know what you joke about when your legs are blown off but Josh somehow found it and that is the guy that I'm getting back and I just thought we're we're going to be able to figure out the no legs thing so that was a um it it went from a very dark scary place to wow, we might be able to actually get through this and be okay, you know. That's that's um, fantastic, really touching, you know, and inspiring to to many people who are going through. You know, lots of people are going through tough times right now, but but to be able to see the good um, in in what you've been dealt, that's just it's really inspiring I, to me personally. And so, Josh. Um, you know, how was it for you seeing Paige for the first time? And then you, you've kind of alluded to this, but, but how did you guys walk through this together? And, and how was Paige th there with you through the healing process? Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, the first time I saw Paige, um, you know, as soon as I saw her come through the door, I'd, I'd gone from, um, I don't remember anything from Kandahar to Germany, but I went from Apparently went from Kandahar to Bagram to Germany and then to Walter Reed Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, but, um, you know, I woke up in Germany sometime and my mom was there with me. And then, um, you know, it took a long time for me to, to get from Germany to Walter Reed. But, um, you know, when I got to Walter Reed, the first time I saw Paige, um, you know, I just started breaking down in tears because, um, you know, I was like, you know, she's going to be upset with me that I went to Afghanistan and lost my legs, you know, and, um, you know, I was crying and she was just like, you know, what's like, why are you crying right now? And I was like, I, I went to Afghanistan and I lost my legs, you know, and, um, she kind of set the tone for my recovery, um, with her response, but she was just like, you know, honestly, like we know where they're at. We're just not going to go back and get them. You know, <laughs> and we, we kind of had a good moment there and laughed yeah. a little bit and, um, you know, I kind of set the tone for my recovery. And, um, for me, you know, that, that physical part of it was, was easy, you know, like the, the military teaches you, um, that your body can handle more than it thinks it can, you know? And, um, so I knew that that part was going to be the easy part. That's the thing that I could control is going to PT and, and getting stronger and, and working on that, you know? And, um, you know, for me, I wanted, you know, I, I still had my guys that were still in Afghanistan, you know, and I didn't want them to have to worry about me while they were over there because they had enough to worry about. Like Paige said, like every time they left the wire, they were getting shot at or, you know, coming across an IED. 
and a lot of times both. And so I never wanted them to have to worry about me. And so um, everything that we put on social media or online or anything was always positive. Like, you know, Josh is doing good. Josh is progressing. Josh is doing this. Josh is doing that, you know, and it kind of um, used it to try to help motivate my guys, you know, and um, honestly, um, you know, Paige was huge through all that, you know, and um, during that time, you know, while I was deployed, I wasn't exactly faithful in my marriage, you know, and we were dealing with that while I was in the hospital. And, um, you know, she stuck right there by my side and she was, you know, amazing. And, um, you know, I, I can't imagine, you know, how hard that was for her, you know, and it kind of gave her an opportunity to, to kind of get out, you know, and a lot of times, um, you know, that, that happens in the military, you know, but she stuck with me and, um, you know, we worked through not only, you know, recovering physically, but recovering our marriage and, and coming out stronger on the other end. Yeah. And I think it, that was a big reason or conviction to write a book about it because people don't mean to do this. And like, I'm, I'm a civilian that loves the military. I think we should just constantly find ways to thank the troops from now until the end of our lives, you know, but people unintentionally kind of hero worship you. And Josh was so good about like, um, you know, like he was saying his mission was I'm going to be positive. So every time my guys come back from these like multiple day missions and they're just beat down, defeated, they can check on me and it's going to like put wind in their sails again, you know, and that was our, that was our motive. And as other people kind of followed along it was just like, you know, you're so inspirational and this and that. And he was, but we were still dealing with very ugly, normal people problems. And Josh is having nightmares about Afghanistan. We've got issues in our marriage. We are in a hospital room that is like an 11 by 11 foot room, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it really just, it, I was convicted because I did not ever want to think people, I, I didn't want to allow people to think that we were just like, you know, Captain America, like, oh, this was a terrible thing, but, but we knew exactly what to do and when to do it because we didn't, you know, and I think that's a huge issue going on in the world right now is that, um, I mean, that's, that's the whole uh, premise of social media, right? Like it's your highlight reel. It's not yeah. real life, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to give people hope because the last thing a veteran needs to do is like use their story to make other veterans look like they haven't handled their time of service well. And so I was like, we need to talk and write about the times we didn't handle your time of service well because that's how it happened you know how it happened is how it happened and that's the story people need the full story not just like what we intentionally tried to put out there to put like good vibes on the internet you know so that was kind of a big motivator for us to kind of get together and like tell the whole thing I mean, well, so that was a great segue into my kind of next question page, uh, talking about your book, uh, Beautifully Broken. And and first off, just uh, thank you again, because um, like I said, it's it takes uh, the service member. Yeah, we get a lot of praise and we get all the discounts and everybody's thank you for the <laughs> service. Uh, but man, the spouses and the, and the family members and, and all the other folks that support us, uh, man, they're, ju they're just as much of a hero as as we are or, or people perceive us to be and so uh thank you for your service and and, and all the things that you've been i appreciate doing. that uh, awesome awesome but um your book beautifully broken which viewers can find at our exchange by the way um it just if you kind of summed it up on on the memoir it's kind of like a memoir of the the journey right mm -hmm. and the journey is not always uh picture perfect or like you said, the highlight reel. I, I'm going to use that. I'm taking that. I'm taking. That <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But but um, can you can you tell us what you want the readers to kind of take away from the story? Yeah, I think uh, what's important is um, we don't just talk about deployment, injury, and recovery. We also talk about the first like two years out, you know. And I think so many service members did exactly what we do. You start a lot of sentences with when I get out of here, you know, when this contract is up or when we, for us, it was when we get out of this hospital, blah, 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 you know, and we just forget that like freedom 
is a lot of responsibility. <laughs> and um, we get out in the civilian world and we think like, we're going to have all this control over things and we get to control our schedule. We're not going to have these crazy deployment cycles and all those things. And it really, what we wrote about is just like how immature we were and how um, we went into that with a lot of selfish ambition. And um, I think, especially for wounded veterans that spend a lot of time in a hospital, your kind of reckoning with your combat experience is very delayed. And I would say, we, we tell people this all the time, but like that whole moment of like laying there, like, why did this happen to me? That really didn't happen to us until we got out of Walter Reed two years later when we were on our own and we went from a place where every third person is an amputee to there's not a single amputee in this town, you know? And so um, we really just tried to write about like how um, this is a segment of your life where people assume that you're healed and you're actually just being bombarded with different problems and you don't know how to handle it. And somehow all of this stuff from your deployment and all the hard things you had to go through while you were in Afghanistan are somehow still making their way to the surface. And it's just a, um, it just gave us a new reason to have to fight against that stuff together. But we were too immature to realize that. So we started kind of going separate ways. And I, I mean, our marriage was, you know, on the chopping block again. And you know, all these things. And so we really just wanted to tell the truth about that. And my goal in doing that was just that, you know, I mean, maybe if we say it, it makes it easier for someone else to say it, you know, this is exactly how I feel, or this, what this guy went through in Afghanistan, that's the same exact stuff we had to deal with. And um, to just know that there's hope behind it. And I think it's, uh, you know, a very important point that I always try to make is that Josh and I are not ever going to get to a place where we don't struggle, but what we've decided is that we're going to struggle as one instead of, I think a lot of spouses and we don't mean to do this, but sometimes it's like, go figure your crap out and don't come back till you do. And, um, a veteran is already so isolated because their life has been so unique and they have gone, gone through things that, regular civilians just cannot ever understand, you know? And so to put all of their healing and all of their uh, accountability and all the things that they need to just put it on them and in efforts to um, preserve yourself, protect your children, whatever your motive is, um, you're, I mean, as a spouse, like I'm just here to say, like you're going to have to risk yourself in order to walk through this together. And it's, it's already kind of an ugly secret situation anyway. So you might as well just jump in there with your spouse and say, hey, I'm sure there's stuff that you've gone through that might be shocking to me or shocking to your grandma or whatever else. But, um, but I'm here to tell you that no matter what you did or what you saw or what you had to do is going to make me stop loving you. That doesn't mean I know what the answer is or what we're supposed to do but you're not going to scare me away. And I think that's, that's 90% of why veterans don't talk because they carry this weight of like, if you only knew you'd yeah. never speak to me again, or you'd look at me different or you'd judge me, you know? And so for a spouse to be able to say like, I'll still be on your team, you know, I mean, that's just, that's half the battle. And so I just kind of wanted to write about how I actually walked through that before I had actually considered cutting it all off, you know? And so I've, I've been on both sides of it. And I think that that was just kind of the truth that people needed to hear, you know? Yeah. No, we appreciate the realness of this book. So uh, you, y'all you kept it real. And I think that's what we need uh, absolutely uh, to, to not glamorize or, or make it seem like we got it all to put together. People look at me because I'm a chief, in the United States Air Force and be like, man, he's got it all together and he's got his own show and he's on the there with Paige or P. Diddy or whoever. It's like, <laughs> no, we, we all got problems and we're all yeah. dealing mm -hmm. with stuff. And and it's uh like you said, and, and veterans, we we're we're sent over to places where we, we're not supposed to talk about it. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we we got obsec and all this different things that we really, you know, can only lean on each other. So man, we just appreciate 
uh, how you've supported Josh through, throughout this whole ordeal. And, uh, and, and Josh, um, I know there was some, you know, you already kind of touched on some of the dark times in the recovery. Uh, and, you know, in the military, we, we preach resiliency and how to stay resilient. Uh, how were you able to kind of stay upbeat? I know you probably naturally uh, a goofball like me uh, and always joking and all this other stuff. Um, but but how, how did you maintain your focus and, and, and kind of work on that resiliency piece during this process? Yeah, so uh, you're exactly right. I am a uh, goofball. Um, and so that, that hey, part... hey, up for the we're going to uh, raise up for the goofballs, man. <laughs> <laughs> but you know for me um you know when i got out of the military you know a couple of things happened um you know when you're in the military there's two things that they beat into you from day one is always have a battle buddy and always have your weapon um and when i got out of the military i essentially lost that community right i kind of lost um you know my battle buddy and then I also kind of lost my, my purpose in life. You know, my purpose when I was in the military was to, to serve my country, you know, and when I got out, I lost that. And, um, you know, I, I really kind of went into a dark place once I got out of the military because I, uh, you know, I, I just didn't have a purpose, you know, like I was going to school, I finished my degree, that was cool. And, um, you know, I was getting a job in the athletic department at Auburn University. And that was that was awesome. But on the inside, like I was still missing something, you know, and um, it was because, um, you know, I wasn't serving uh, anymore. I wasn't serving in my community. I didn't have that community period, you know, and um, if it wasn't for Paige, I don't know if I would have found that, you know, she tricked me into going to a small group in our church and, um, you know, getting involved with other men that were, you know, struggling with the same things that I struggle with, you know, and, um, you know, as men, we're not really open about sharing feelings, you know, but when you have a group of men and, you know, you sit around and talk for a while, eventually things start opening up, you know, and um, I realized pretty quickly that there were other men that were struggling with the exact same things that I was struggling with. And so I wasn't alone, you know, mm. and that kind of, that kind of got me back into community. You know, I started doing more small groups at my church and even leading some small groups. And, um, you know, during that time, I realized like I, I had a fear to lead um, again, you know, when I got out of them, when I was in the military, that was easy for me. I loved doing it. I loved leading. But when I led, I got injured and then others subsequently got injured or killed. And um, so, you know, after I got injured, I just chose not to lead in any capacity, whether it was in my family, spiritually, at work, didn't matter. I didn't want to lead. And so, um, you know, I kind of found that desire to lead again when I when I got back in community. Um, and then even recently, um, you know, I started realizing that that need to serve others, you know, it kind of puts your life back into perspective when you're serving others, um, because you can see that what God's blessed you with, you know, and um, God's blessed me tremendously. I mean, we've got this amazing house that was built by home for our troops. You know, we live in a great community here in Auburn. Um, we're right down the road from Columbus, where I did all of my, um, you know, basic training in airborne school and um, really close to that military community. And, you know, we've just been really blessed during this time. And so um, being able to serve and serve in the military community again has kind of helped me to, um, you know, keep things from perspective and, and, you know, the legs, I, you know, losing my legs wasn't that big of a deal. You know, I just have metal ones now, you know, I can't run as fast as I used to. I have running legs that are in my attic because I wasn't a runner before, but I've got them. You know? um, but, Prepared. Yeah, just, just in case. That's the case, uh, yeah, exactly. But yeah, I'm that, you know, getting back into community and, and finding those battle buddies again um, was huge for me. And, you know, that kind of led into serving and serving that military community and gave me that purpose again. And, um, you know, another thing, you know, we kind of look at, you know, I, I look at Paige as my battle buddy now. I kind of, I was a, you know, a solo guy for a long time. And, um, you know, I kind of looked at her as my battle buddy now. And we kind of look at this as like our mission field, our, you know, our mission where, you know, we're doing this together now. And that that's helped me tremendously. Yeah. And I think with the leadership portion of it, something that I didn't see coming was that, um, all I ever really wanted from Josh was for him to just get back into that leadership mode. And I can't tell you how much it's changed the vibe of our household. 
that he, and that doesn't mean he has all the answers and it definitely doesn't mean we don't argue, <laughs> but <laughs> it's one of those things where it is just so amazing to be married to somebody that wakes up with an intention, you know, and wakes up with like, I'm here to serve the people in this house. I understand I have an important role and I want to do it to the best of my ability. Like you will figure out marriage and parenting if you'll just bring that to the table every okay. day, you know? And when I, when I watch Josh, which I, I didn't have the language to really express what I was observing for those years. But when I watched Josh just try to like the term we come, we say is like, he was trying to fly under the radar. You know, I'm just trying to be a regular old person, just pay the bills and keep the kids alive. You know, it's hard and, to do when you don't have legs yeah. to stick out. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, that's not even an option for us anyway. But um, you know, it, it really just, I just saw him like, I don't want to make decisions. I don't want to be in the forefront. I don't want to, um, I don't want to put pressure on myself that might affect other people. And when you're in combat, like that's where he thrived, you know? So he was really denying a very crucial part of his own personality for the sake of like self-preservation, you know? And so, yeah, you have to risk mistakes if you're the leader, but like our lives, even with the mistakes are just so much richer and, you know, we just, we're just going for like, um, influence on other people, hopefully opening the door for other veterans or like, oh, you think that's embarrassing? Well, read this book. We wrote a book about a, a bunch of embarrassing things we did just to hopefully make it easier for someone. And just for him to like really embrace that part of him, it just really shows like, this is like, you're better this way, you know? And mm -hmm. so I think something just for wives is just you know, um, try to be the encourager. Like this is a process not going to happen overnight. And there's no like magic word that's going to make your husband or spouse, uh, start viewing themselves that way again, but just stay encouraging, you know, and I think I did a lot of griping <laughs> and complaining, <laughs> but, um, just encourage and like, you know, and encourage and praise, you know, that's what we're supposed to do, you know. Yeah, that's great advice. And you guys have mentioned family and Paige, you guys have been blessed with two children. So we'd be remiss though, if we didn't have you tell the story of how you surprised Josh with the news that the ch second child was <laughs> on the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Josh, um, well, our first daughter was born at Walter Reed hospital. And so that, that was, one was also a surprise. Yeah. It was a surprise because at that point we were told we couldn't have children because of Josh's injury. So that was just a real victory lap for Josh when we like went back to the urologist and Josh mm -hmm. like pulled me in the room and was like, yeah, well, guess what? She's pregnant. And I was like, <laughs> and I'm me in an amputee hospital. This is everything I could have ever dreamed, you know? And so <laughs> the second child, we were in the civilian world and I just thought, you know, I really want to do something special for him. And um, I actually got all of his co-workers to like co-conspire with me because at that time Josh was working at Auburn University and um, I was already through the first trimester so that's probably the biggest oh, favor wow. I've ever done <laughs> for Josh was like hiding this pregnancy through the first trimester but um, but yeah I took him to Jordan Hare Stadium and we Auburn has the biggest video board in college football and I support I surprised him with tickets to the masters. And then like, I had a, a, you know, video that I had made and then it said, um, wait, there's one more gift. Um, the only catch is you can't open until October. And, oh, um, man. it was a video of the ultrasound and Josh just broke down and cried in front of all of his friends. <laughs> <laughs> man, she put you on the spot, man. No, it was really dusty that day. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that is yeah, awesome. he was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was a cool day. That's that's awesome. That's really special, and so glad that you guys could share it with us. But guys, before we say goodbye, remind us where can we find you on social media, and then where can the viewers go to learn more about Beautifully Broken? Um, well, we have uh, Paige and Josh Wetzel on Facebook. We also have Paige and Josh Um, Josh is pretty much on Twitter. Um, 
what are you on Twitter? Joshua W. Wetzel. Joshua W. Wetzel on Twitter. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I'm kind of a Facebook, Instagram person, so I'm just Paige Wetzel on on both. And um, and then the book is anywhere books are sold, and um, we have an audio version, and obviously just the physical copy of the book. Um, but you can get that wherever you get your audio books or wherever books are sold, <laughs> including the exchange. including. Yes, including, including the exchange. Hey, Josh, man, you, you're hired. Would you want to come over? Here, <laughs> oh man, so that's man. Today, you guys have dropped so many nuggets and so many, uh, you know, stories about life and resiliency and and and, and tragedy and just you kind of covered the whole spectrum uh, with, with, with just this interview itself. So I can imagine the book is just really going to give some people some real life lessons to, uh, to, to live by and to learn from because, because sometimes you don't have to make the mistake in your life if you heard or read or, or, or got the information from other people. So, right. uh, man, we appreciate you for, for this time, for this interview. This was, this has been an awesome interview. Uh, like I said, you guys have given us so many things to take home and digest. Um, thank you for sharing your amazing life with us. Uh, you know, like I said, Paige and Josh, man, you guys, you guys are welcome here anytime. So if you come to Dallas, come, come look us up. Yeah, right. we will. Yeah, thanks yeah, for yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, just, just to know, you know, you're talking to a huge military community. So, you know, America's airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and, uh, Space Force personnel. Now we got Space Force yeah. in the house. Uh, we, w- we wish you all the best, man. And we, we cheering for you. And, uh, definitely going to check out that book yeah, right. we appreciate you and yeah. thanks for having us on the show today awesome awesome so if you could just stay awesome. back uh after the show's uh, kind of wrapped up uh i got to get some information from you yep awesome thank you so much yep thanks bye for guys Chat out <laughs>